أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وحبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين وحجته على الخلائق أجمعين سيدنا وإمام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي أمرنا مهدي هذه الأمة وطاووس أهل الجنة الحجة بن الحسن العسكري فداه أرواح العالمين اللهم كل وليك الحجة بن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك طوعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا اللهم وهب لنا رأفته ورحمته وعونه ودعاءه وخيره ورضاه ما ننال به سعة من رحمتك وفوزا عندك يا كريم برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين My dear brothers and sisters السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome to another session of our discussion on Islamic family ethics in which we have been discussing the formation of the family, the uh, critical steps that need to be taken, the aims, the objectives, as well as the etiquettes and the moral principles that deal with this incredibly important step that has been encouraged by uh, Islam and by our divinely appointed leaders and role models. One of the things that we've been discussing in particular over the last uh, couple of sessions is the importance of choosing the right role models. To actually adopt the Ahlul Bayt, the Holy Messenger of God, His final uh, and seal of His messengers, as well as His family, uh, whom he appointed as our leaders when he famously declared over and over again, Inni tarikum fikum al-thiqlain kitab Allah wa itrati ahla bayti ma in tamassaktum bihima lan tadillu ba'liya abada. If you're looking to save yourselves from deviation, from uh, becoming uh, lost in this. Uh, incredibly confusing maze that is life, all of these conflicting ideologies and cultures and lifestyles. Every day there's a whole new lifestyle that's being presented to us as being perfectly acceptable and legitimate. And it's confusing. It's confusing even for those who are grounded in their religious values, let alone the youth, let alone people who uh, don't have a firm basis and foundation in the teachings and the values of this beautiful religion of ours. And so what's going to happen is that a lot of the, uh, the, the youth, the up-and-coming generation, they'll be lost and they'll be like someone who is in the middle of this maze. They don't know which direction to take. They don't know what uh, model to adopt. They don't know what lifestyle uh, they can choose for themselves. And so they'll be completely flabbergasted and confused. And so what's critical is that we present to them the model that has been passed down to us from the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt so that they could have a model that they can then compare all of the other lifestyles to that standard, right? It's the standard. It's like the, uh, the, the standard set for uh, the, the meter, right? The hundred centimeter, where you have an actual bar that has been measured exactly to the standard of a hundred centimeters. And it's kept in a safe, it's kept in uh, a vacuum uh, so that it doesn't get affected, so that the length, the volume, 
uh, the density of this metal bar doesn't change. And if there is any confusion, if there is any uh, question as to what the standard meter is, you always have that to go back to. So, what did the Holy Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt tell us about how to form a family? What is the ideal family according to them, according to our religion? If we don't present this to our youth, for whatever reason, because some might think that it's archaic or that it's not relevant anymore or that you know, it, it might put people off or anything like that. All of these demonic whispers that we hear from people now and again, they have to be cast aside because if we don't present people with the gold standard, that is the Ahlul Bayt السلام, then we can't blame anybody for being confused. We can't blame anyone for veering off the track, the right path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so that's the point of this series, so that we could explore the actual standard set by the Ahlul Bayt from the original sources, from the actual words of God, the Holy Prophet and the Imams alayhim salam presented to people so that at least no one can then say, I didn't know and I wasn't sure. And we did things, you know, I'm sure you've heard people, especially the older generation who say, well, back then we didn't have access to all of this information. And so we did things haphazardly. We did things in a manner that was not really grounded in our faith or our values. And so we, we made a lot of mistakes. Well, the idea is that we break the cycle. The idea is that we stop uh, the vicious circle that has been uh, claiming victims from within the community of the followers of the Ahlul Bayt, from the community of Muslims, so that we could begin anew. We can start a new chapter where we actually follow the example set by the Holy Prophet and his family and therefore find success. One thing that I want to talk about in this particular session is the dowry. Because in the previous session, we talked about some of the rituals uh, and, and traditions and practices of uh, our modern weddings and how they have absolutely no connection to the authentic uh, teachings of Islam. Uh, but one of the areas that uh, is, uh, uh, is very clearly not... Uh, congruent or compatible with Islamic teachings is the dowry. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that. But I think it's important that, again, we understand when we say Mahru Sunnah, and I'll talk about that, inshallah, um, it refers to something very specific. It, refer, it refers to the tradition of the Holy Prophet and in particular, his daughter Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Again, what's happening when we talk about Mahra Sunnah, when the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt stress and emphasize the importance of Mahra Sunnah, what they're actually doing is that they're presenting Fatima to Zahra as that gold standard, right? We know for a fact that Fatima to Zahra is the greatest woman of all time in the history of mankind, right? She was. Uh, if we're going to discuss her lineage, she was the daughter of the master of God's creation and the seal of the prophets of God and the one beloved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So, Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam was someone who occupied a position that was enviable by any woman or man for that matter anywhere in the world. And yet, let's take a look at her dowry. The Holy Prophet, as we said in the previous session, says that خَيْرُ نِسَاءِ أُمَّتِي أَصْبَحُهُنَّ وَجْهًا وَأَقَلُّهُنَّ مَهْرًا He sets the rule. The measuring stick is provided by the Holy Prophet. He says that the best woman 
in my nation, in my community of followers, is the one whose face is luminous, who lights up the room when she walks in, and whose dowry is minimal. In other words, the amount of money that she stipulates as part of her marriage contract is the least. The least. So, this is a broad and general rule. What does aqalluhunna mahra actually mean? What is the actual amount? Is there an actual amount or is that something that's subject to debate and discussion? Can people choose whatever amount they want? Well, the answer is that number one, yeah, you can stipulate whatever amount you want. You can do what a lot of people do in, uh, for instance, in Iran, in parts of Afghanistan, in parts of India and Pakistan, where they stipulate and specify exorbitant amounts of money that truly break a person's back. We're talking hundred gold coins, right? We're talking hundreds of ounces of pure gold. We're talking about staggering amounts that are very difficult to wrap your heads around, right? So, legally speaking, you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to choose whatever dowry you want. But then we're not engaged in a legal debate, are we? This isn't about what's allowed and what isn't allowed. This is about what is the best, most optimum, most um, idealistic uh, type of marriage. Because, and I want to open two parentheses here, which I think are very, very important. And that is, my dear brothers and sisters, marriage isn't like a business partnership. It's not like a financial transaction. Marriage requires a great deal of blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it to work. A successful marriage isn't one where the husband and wife follow a checklist of things they must do or things they must avoid. It's not that. A successful marriage obviously has to do with communication, it has to do with the expression of love, it has to do with all of these things, understanding and listening to the other party and so forth. But the biggest factor that sets the, the, a, a successful marriage apart from one that is a complete train wreck is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides to step in and how much He chooses to bless this marriage, right? Nowhere is this more important than in a marriage contract where you pray to God that things are going to go well. And the reason for that is obvious because in a marriage, you are not marrying two robots. You're not marrying two computers or machines that somehow are supposed to interoperate. They're supposed to work together. Two human beings are getting married. Each with their own set of emotions, desires, things that they hate, things that they detest, things that they wish they could achieve, right? Aims, objectives. And so to make this union work, to make it somehow successful, requires not just effort on the part of each individual, each of the two spouses, but it requires direct divine intervention. It requires what we call barakah, right? Now, one of the things that is uh, often the greatest source of barakah, the greatest source of blessing, or conversely, the greatest source of cursing the marriage is the dowry. Let me share a hadith with you. Amir al-Mu'mineen, alayhi salatu wassalam, was once approached by a man. Listen very carefully to this. This person came to the Imam and he said to him, I have this pain, I have this disease, and I have consulted physicians, I've tried everything, I haven't been able to heal it or get rid of it. What do I do? By the way, this has, it, it actually appears in multiple traditions in different ways, but I'm sharing one version of it today. 
So he says to the Imam, he comes to him, begging him for some kind of relief. He says, what do I do? Now let's not forget that Amir al-Mu'mineen, just like his brother Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, they had the ability to perform a miracle. They could do something right then and there and maybe heal this individual. If Isa alayhi salam had If Prophet Isa السلام, had the ability to heal the sick, then Ali ibn Abi Talib surely had the same power. And yet, he didn't do that. He said to this person who came asking for some kind of cure for the disease he suffered from, he said to him, go take one silver coin from the dowry that you gave your wife. Ask her for permission to take it from her. If she gives you permission, then mix the, uh, use this dirham to buy honey. Then mix the honey with rainwater and eat it. So I'll read the actual hadith for you, right? The hadith says, اشتكى رجل إلى أمير المؤمنين he complained of some sickness or pain. فَقَالَ لَهُ سَلْ مِنْ امْرَأَتِكَ دِرْهَمًا مِنْ صِدَاقِهَا Ask your wife to give you a coin from the dowry that you gave her. فَاشْتَرْ بِهِ عَسَلًا فَاشْرَبْهُ بِمَا السَّمَاءِ Buy honey with that silver coin. It's the equivalent of about one point, if I'm not mistaken, uh, th sorry, three grams of silver, right? And I'll get to the, the math of all of this later. But the Imam said, use those three grams of silver to buy honey, mix it with rainwater, and eat it. فَفَعَلَ مَا أَمَرَ بِهِ أَوْ أُمِرَ بِهِ The man did exactly as he was instructed by the Imam. فَبَرِئَ He became well. So he came back to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said to him, this disease that I had, it's gone, right? Did you get this from Rasulullah? Did you learn this prescription from the Holy Prophet The Imam said, no, this wasn't from the Holy Prophet. However, I have read that God speaks about the dowry in the Holy Quran. And he says in one verse, Eat it, meaning use the money that you get as part of your dowry, to eat it and enjoy this food. And Allah has also, in other words, this tells you that the dowry is blessed. فَكُلُوهُ and Maria. Also, the Imam says that I've read a verse in the Quran in which he's, God speaks about honey. And he says, فِيهِ شِفَاءٌ لِلنَّاسِ There is healing in honey for the people. So that's verse number two. And I've also read in the Quran when Allah speaks about rainwater and He says, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَاءً مُبَارَكًا And we have sent down from the heavens blessed water. فَاشْتَمَعَ The Imam then says, فَاشْتَمَعَ الْهَنِيءُ وَالْمَرِيءُ وَالْبَرَكَةِ Here we have these three components coming together. Something that is satisfying and something that quenches your thirst, and something that is blessed was shifa and healing in reference to the honey. So I said that I would bring all of this together so that it would bring you healing. فَرَجَوْتُ بِذَلِكَ الْبُورْ So I uh, hoped that through this formula, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would heal you of your disease and of your sickness. Brothers and sisters, as I said, there's multiple versions of this incident. Someone came to Imam al-Sadiq and other Imams. The point that's being made here is this, that the dowry is truly blessed, truly blessed. Let's not turn it into a curse. Let's not make it something that causes nothing but misery and pain for this new family. You see, as I said earlier, that 
since our role models are the Ahlul Bayt السلام, then we must follow their example. For instance, Mahr sunnah was the amount of dowry that Rasulullah paid to Khadija bint Khuwailid alayha salatu wassalam. How much was it? It was 500 silver coins, which was called dirham at the time. Now, luckily, we know exactly the weight of 500 silver coins, which was the legal tender at the time of the Holy Prophet and the Imams السلام. We know the actual weight today. How much is it? 500 silver coins equate to 1,500 grams of silver, right? Now, the current price for silver as of the time of recording this video is uh, 0 0.7 dollars, meaning 70 cents per gram. Now, you can do the math easily. This equates to just over a thousand US dollars in the dowry that Rasulullah gave to Khadija and Amirul Mu'mineen gave to Fatima alayhi salam because that standard was set by the Holy Prophet's marriage to Khadija and was followed by every subsequent Imam and infallible divinely appointed leader. 500 silver coins equates to 1500 grams of silver which as I said in today's dollars is just over a thousand. Now you can do the math in your local currency. Is this the recommended? Is this the recommended um, dowry? Absolutely. There is no question that that is the amount that is recommended. In fact, it is so highly recommended as per the teachings and traditions of the Ahlul Bayt السلام, that it becomes mu'akkad, mustahab mu'akkad. Highly, highly emphasized, recommended act. In other words, while it's not haram to give more or less, it is highly discouraged to give anything other than that. Can you give, for instance, some people say Mahra Sunnah is my dowry. In addition to, I don't know, a gold set. Can you do that? The answer is yes, but this isn't Mahra Sunnah. You've ruined it. If you add anything to it, or if you subtract from it, you have ruined the equation. Can you say Mahra Sunnah in addition to the cost of performing Hajj. Yes, you can, but it wouldn't be Mahr Sunnah anymore. It would be something that you've made up. You're doing your best, I'm sure. You have the best of intentions, but this is no longer Mahr Sunnah if you add anything on top. Can you say it's Mahr Sunnah and a car? Again, you can do that legally speaking, but it would no longer be Mahr Sunnah. It's not the dowry that Rasulullah gave to Lady Khadija. It's not the dowry that Amir al muminin gave to Fatima al Zahra salam. Can you say that instead of silver, I'll calculate the price according to, to gold? Because some people do this, right? They say that uh, uh, back then, Mahra Sunnah was 500 silver coins, but 500 silver coins could buy you, at that time, 50 gold coins, 50 dinars. So the price of 50 dinars today would be roughly $13,000, right? Can it be gold instead of, can I adopt the gold standard instead of the silver standard? The answer is no. You can do that legally speaking, but it would no longer be Mahra Sunnah. So the recommendation, the standard set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his prophet and his messengers is that when people get married, they uh, they, they, they assign and they choose Mahr sunnah as their dowry. Not a dime more, not a dime less. Not a dollar more, not a dollar less. Not a rupee more, not a rupee less. That is Mahr sunnah again 
I have to repeat myself. I'm not saying that it's haram to give anything other than that. Extra perhaps, you can do that. But you'd be missing out. You'd be missing out on the barakah. You'd be missing out on the incredible divine blessings that are attached to and associated with Mahr sunnah right? It's like a phone number. It's like an account number in a bank. If you add anything to it, you won't get the same account number. It'll be something completely different. If you subtract from it, if you, you know, if you change any of the numbers, if you move them around, even one number will ruin the whole thing. You will miss out on a great deal of blessings. So let's make sure that we follow this tradition. Many people do it to this day. Many scholarly families, many um, families that are, you know, somehow connected to maraji' and ulama and so forth. Many, many, many people do that, right? Um, in our own family, Mahra Sunnah is the standard. And keep in mind that it's so, so blessed. Obviously, there are things um, that are also recommended. I might have mentioned this before. It's highly recommended that a wife, once she receives that uh, dowry of hers, that she then gifts it back to her husband. It's recommended to do that. You can choose not to, and that's fine, right? But it's recommended that you do that. And that when you take it, that you use it in something that's worthwhile. In other words, some people use Mahra Sunnah to buy a TV, to buy some sound system, some fancy piece of furniture. Isn't it such a shame? Isn't it uh, an incredible waste of this beautiful opportunity? Imagine if you were given a gift by a marja, this grand lofty scholar that you respect and you admire, gives you a hundred dollars. Then you go use the hundred dollars to buy some ice cream or candy. Wouldn't it be a waste? Wouldn't it be uh, shameful that you spent it on something that's just simply not worth it? Something that's a total waste? It's like throwing it away. You've been given this incredible gift that's been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, do not waste it. Do not waste it on things that will wither away and be, be thrown out at some point. Use it like this hadith recommends in the event of a sickness in the family, in the event of, God forbid, um, someone falling ill and the doctors not giving you much hope. Use it for that. Or use it to go to Hajj, use it to go to Ziyarah. Use it as the basis and the capital on which you build your spiritual portfolio. That's what you're supposed to use it on. Use it to get other people married. Use it to help families that are struggling. Use it to help someone who's never been to the shrine of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam to go and perform their first ziyarah. Use it in a way that amplifies it and maximizes it so that the rewards become abundant, inshaAllah. Finally, and I'll leave you with this, my brothers and sisters. Always keep in mind, what did the Prophet do? What did the Imams do? The reason I say it's recommended to give the dowry back to the husband is that Khadija alayhi salatu wasalam did exactly that. Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam gave everything back. Remember, the dowry of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam was used to buy the most basic pieces of household, essential household items, like a blanket, like a hijab, like a, a, a wooden um, a mat, right? Uh, on some plates and pots and utensils, on the most basic household essentials. But all of that was shared with who? With Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. It's not something that Fatima al-Zahra bought for herself. She simply used it, or the Holy Prophet وآله, on behalf of Fatima, he used the money that was uh, acquired through the sale of the shield of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salatu wasalam, a particular brand of shield which the Imam sold for about 400, some hadith say 400, others say 500, it's around the 500 
silver coins mark, as I said earlier. And that money was then used to buy those household items and uh, essential items, which they used to live together. But look at how that marriage was blessed infinitesimally, brothers and sisters. Blessed like no other marriage has ever been blessed. Simplicity is key. Following the example set by the Ahlul Bayt is key. And again, for those of you who haven't watched it, I did a series last year called The House of Bliss, specifically talking about the house of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam. Look it up. Watch that series. It's, I think, about three episodes or so, so that you can learn what the example of the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam, in particular Fatima to Zahra and Amir al Mu'mineen, was, so that we can try and emulate it and copy it as much as we can. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والحمد لله رب العالمين وصل اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله